Hey folks, it's Dr. Davidson, and you're watching the first screencast from Dynamics 1, in which we will cover foundational concepts. Uh, a couple things. First, if you were in class, you've already seen some of this, at least through the first page. But I encourage you to watch it anyway, because a review never hurts. And then second, if you're watching this and you haven't read Chapter 1 in Kasdan and Paley, stop. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go directly to Kasdan and Paley, read chapter one, it's only about nine pages, and then come back to the screencast. All right, let's get started. First off, dynamics is the science that describes the motion of bodies. If you took statics with me, then everything that we talked about in statics was stationary and nothing moved. In dynamics, everything moves, and that makes our lives quite a bit more complicated. And so we're going to be very systematic on how we go about this, and we have to be foundational at the beginning before we can get into the more complex problems. Now, more precisely about dynamics, it's not only the science that describes motion, but it determines very specific parameters like position and velocity of an object, and we put those and characterize those under the actions of forces. And so we're, by the end of this course, we're going to have a full understanding of how particles move underneath different forces. Now, I've got to warn you, this is not a continuation of statics. In fact, there's very little that those two courses share. This is a pretty difficult topic to understand. I don't say that to scare you, but to say you really need to, to pay attention and, and work hard at some of these concepts. So we're going to start very basic today. We'll start with vectors, and vectors are something that you've seen before. And the definition that we have here is, is probably similar to what you would write down, but it's a geometric entity that has both magnitude and direction in space. Now, if you originally thought of a vector and you said, oh, I need three coordinates, that puts us in a different world, and that's one way to describe vectors, but from a conceptual perspective, we need to be thinking about a geometric object. And so this is something perhaps new in the definition of a vector, but in dynamics, we're actually talking about geometry. And to understand dynamics, you have to understand geometry on a pretty deep level. And so in this course, you're going to be tempted to turn this into a math class. Don't. Resist that. I will resist that at all costs with you. Um, but what we'll do is that we're always going to take a two-pronged approach. The first thing we're going to do is any problem that we have that involves a moving body, we have to first conceptualize the geometry of the problem, and then we apply the mathematics to turn the crank and solve it. Okay? So, we have multiple types of vectors that we're going to encounter in this class. So several of these you've seen before, and those are vectors like force vectors, Okay. You've seen moment, which recall are vectors. We've seen position vectors. And we've also seen unit vectors. But some new things that we're going to go over are going to be velocity vectors. We have acceleration vectors. momentum vectors, impulse vectors, and several others. So, but keep in mind that vectors are really what we're after here. Vectors help us, um, well, vectors exist, rather, and, and then being able to conceptualize that helps us make sense of, the, uh, of a rather complex topic. One thing you'll find in this class is that notation is extremely important, and particularly vector notations. So if you take a look at the vector that we see here, we see R, P, with a subscript, P slash O, and then a T. And so what this, telling is, what this is telling us is that this is a position vector. Okay, you've seen this before. And we know it's a vector because it has a bold type. And so in the book, bold type indicates vectors. If it's in an italicized, non-bold type, that indicates that the quantity is a scalar. 
Now let's take a look at what this actually means and break this down. We have an R, it says a position. And if we're describing a vector, then that position vector is going to look like this. We have an arrow, and then the position itself is from one point to another. And so the tip is first, and then the tail comes after the slash. So this vector would look like the tail is at O, and the tip is at point P. So this is describing a vector of point P with respect to O. So when you read this, it's the position of point P with respect to O. And then in the parentheses, we see here that it says that it's a function of time. So the vector changes with respect to time, as denoted by, point, as denoted by T. Now, putting the parentheses T is generally overkill in this class. This is dynamics, so we know that things change over time. We know that things are moving. So oftentimes, we'll just get rid of that part. Now, if in the book, vectors are given as boldface and scalars are italicized, then when we write this vector it by hand, we can't do boldface and italicized unless you're an art major. So we would write this as R, P, with respect to O, and we're going to put an underline. And the underline indicates that this is a vector. Okay, If there's no underline, then it's a scalar. Do not neglect this. You will get problems wrong throughout the entire quarter if you don't distinguish between vectors and scalars. So every time you write a vector, you must, you must, you must indicate that it's a vector. One exception to this is when that I like to use to distinguish unit vectors. And so a unit vector, which is a vector that has a magnitude of 1, when I write these are always going to have a hat. So this would be the unit vector u, the unit vector e sub x, the unit vector a sub 1. So anytime you see a hat, that indicates that it is a vector, but it's a vector that has a length of 1. All right, let's discuss properties of vectors. So let's say we've got a vector, and it's just a vector b. And remember, this is a geometric entity, so b just exists, and it exists in space. We know that, that this vector v, vector b, has a magnitude and a direction. So we define the magnitude, which is the length of the vector, as this. This indicates the length of the vector. These two bars on each side indicate that this is called the norm. Okay, We get the length of the vector by calculating the norm. Now notice we still don't have coordinates yet. That's the magnitude of the vector. And then we need to define the direction of the vector. And so the direction of the vector is going to be the unit vector that points in that direction. So we can define a unit vector, u sub b, which is saying that it's a unit vector in the direction of the vector b. And remember, with a unit vector, we're going to put a hat on it to indicate that it's the length 1. Mathematically, the unit vector is defined u sub b is going to be equal to the vector b, and we're going to divide that by the magnitude of b. So we'll divide it by the norm of b, and dividing by the norm is we're normalizing the length. Now another property of vectors is that when we have two vectors that we add together, that they form a resultant vector. So if we go back to our O and our P, and we want to add another vector that goes from point P to point Q, then the resultant vector that goes from 0 or O to Q is going to be R of Q with respect to O is equal to the vector r 
of p with respect to o plus the vector r of q with respect to p. Okay, let me, let me say that again. We have the vector of p with respect to o, and we're going to add to that the vector of q with respect to p. And that gives us the, unit, the vector of q with respect to o. And remember, this is called the triangle rule, in which we put our vectors from tip to tail, and they add like vectors. So one more thing that could be unique or new to you uh, with vectors is in the definition we said it's a geometric entity that has both magnitude and direction in space. What space does a vector live in? It lives in a three-dimensional Euclidean space. And so that's important to keep in mind as we define the next items of reference frames and eventually coordinate systems. Whenever you encounter a vector that's related to a change in time, you always have to ask a question. And it's a really important question to ask. But let's say you have a velocity, or I ask you the question, what's the velocity of that point? You should immediately ask me a question back that says, according to whom? And we define that by using reference frames. So a reference frame being a point of view from which observations are made regarding the motion of the system. Now this is a geometric concept still that lies in 3D Euclidean space. So every single dynamics problem that we work is going to involve defining reference frames. And we'll do it like this. We'll draw a reference frame. We'll define where a reference frame begins. So in this case, the origin is at point O. This tells us that point O is fixed within the reference frame. We also need to name the reference frame. So this is reference frame I. In the book, these look like cal cal calligraphy letters. Um, just write them normally, and I'll know what you're talking about. Now, let's draw that same vector that we've been working with, which is a position vector that tells us about the point P with respect to O. And so this position vector, R of P with respect to O, is defined here at time T. Now remember, this is dynamics, and so we want to know how that point moves. And if point P moves to this position, over the time delta t, then now this new vector that we have is now r of p with respect to o, but instead of being at time t, this is at time t plus delta t. So the point has moved, the vector has changed, and so now instead of describing this as a single point, we now have information about the velocity of the vector. And that velocity of the vector is going to be in this direction, and this is the velocity of p with respect to o. Now, you should be asking a question right now, and that question should be, according to whom? So essentially saying, where are we observing this from? Okay. And we need to define that. We are, in this case, we're observing it in the reference frame I. And so this, this upper left-hand superscript needs to be on all velocity vectors, on all acceleration vectors, on all uh, momentum vectors, because if you change your reference frame, it changes how that vector is described. So let me flesh that out just a little bit more, in that if we're calculating the velocity of P with respect to O, and we're doing this in reference frame I, then what we're doing is we're trying to find an instantaneous velocity. Because remember, this is actually at time T. And so this velocity of P with respect to O, according to reference frame I, is going to be the limit as delta T approaches zero and then it's going to be r of p with respect to o t plus delta t minus r of p with respect to o of t divided by 
delta t. And this is the time differentiation of that vector. So the other way that we write this is, is going to be d dt of r of p with respect to o. But remember, this d dt, this change over time, has to be taken according to a per particular reference frame. Okay, so stop just a moment and let this sink in. That any time we defi define a velocity, it's dependent upon the frame of reference in which it's observed. So therefore, you must always, always specify the reference frame. And we do this using this upper left hand. It's a, it's a left hand superscript, and this is called reference frame notation. So velocity is defined then as the change in time of a position with respect to a particular reference frame. All right, so far we've only dealt with geometric concepts, and so we haven't done any quantification of this at all. And it's only after defining the geometry that we can now turn to the, to the quantities and the mathematics using coordinates. And that'll help us actually solve these problems. So to do that, we define a coordinate system. And so a coordinate system is a set of scalars that locate the position of a point relative to another point in a reference frame. So to define the position of a single particle, we now need to have three coordinates. And this set of scalars is called a coordinate system. And most often we think of this as x, y, and z. And that's a great way to go. We're going to end up with lots of coordinates depending on how many particles that we have, depending on which reference frames we're using. Now because they're scalars, because they're scalars, when we take the time differentiation of these, d, d, t, then we don't need to define what reference frame that we take them according to. So this is simply going to be x dot, y dot, and z dot, indicating that these are the speeds of these scalars. So x dot is the speed of that scalar x, y being the position, y dot being the speed, and then z being the position, z dot being the speed. Now, although we don't need to define this in terms of reference frame notation, we still are going to say this is in the reference frame i because that's going to help us with the bookkeeping. If I need to go find the scalar x, which is telling me a position, then I, need to, then I know now that I need to go to my, where I define my reference frame i and how I define those bases. So we still do keep our i as a subscript now to help us understand where to go get that information. Now the position and speeds go together and they're very important. We, state, we stated that in our definition of dynamics. We're actually trying to define the positions and speeds of a point. And so this is called the state of the particle. And we need this to completely describe the motion of a point. If it's in three dimensions, we need a speed and a position in three dimensions, so there are actually six parameters that we need. Now, foundational to this course is developing what are called equations of motion. And this is our link to ordinary differential equations. Equations of motions are three second order differential equations whose solution is the position and speed, which remember we called the position and the speed the state and we're, so we're always trying to solve for the state of the system, the state of the particles. And we get these equations of motion from the laws of mechanics. So we're going to use the laws of mechanics to define the equations of motion. Oftentimes we'll end a problem at the equations of motion. In our laboratory, we'll be solving for these equations of motion numerically. Whenever we're able to, we can solve for the equations of motion analytically. So we'll even start this um, in the next couple class periods. Our laws of mechanics are things like Newton's law. F equals ma. That's in vector notation. F equals ma, and we'll cover this in the next session. So in summary, we have 
foundational concepts, which are geometric and mathematical. I want you to be thinking about dynamics as this study of geometric concepts. And so we said that several of our geometric pieces are going to be vectors, we have reference frames, laws of mechanics are also geometric, and how you need to think about this is that the geometric concepts exist. Okay, we don't get to decide whether they exist or whether they don't exist. They just do. There's some interesting ontological concepts here about existence, and so you just need to accept that. They exist, but you as an engineer, it's your job to describe them. And so that's where we come in with our mathematical um, descriptions. And to do that, the mathematical pieces that we talked about are coordinates, coordinate systems, the state, so remember recall the state being the position and the speed, and equations of motion. And remember we get equations of motion starting with the laws of mechanics. Alright, so this wraps up the foundational concepts, lesson one. Be sure that you're studying this along with the book. Take the homework quiz in the link below this video, and I'll see you in class.